took a stand for me. Leading to that bright abode Where forever my soul shall be free Won't that be a happy time? Heaven's bells will sweetly chime When the home gates swing open for me And that will be, that will be a happy day, day. Open for me. Though sometimes the path may lead to the veil of sin and greed, Jesus ever my refuge will be. Soon at home, my trials o'er, I shall praise Him evermore. When the home gates swing open for me, and that will be. Walking in his light hey, till my hey. faith shall end inside. He will lead me till safe for the sea. I shall find a welcome there and a crown of glory where when the home gates swing open for me. Oh, that will be, that will be a happy day. Day. Happy day. when the cloud of clouds has to Oh, 
reward. Junior's sweet heaven's reward. I'm not, I'm not returning to sin. I made my vow. There's nothing to go back to. Lord, praise God. Heaven's in view. I'm too near my heavenly home. Sin, I made my vow. There's nothing to go back to. All praise God, heaven's in view. I'm too near my heavenly home to turn back now. Amen. All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God, my yesterday. This pilgrim land There is a friend Who walks with me Leads me safely Through the sinking sand It is the Christ of Calvary This would be my prayer Dear Lord Each day to help me Do the best I can For I need thy life To guide me Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. I need thee every hour. Through this pilgrim land, protect me by thy power. Hear my feeble plea. Jesus, hold my hand. Let me travel in the light divine that I may see the blessed way. Keep me that I may be holy, that and sing redemption song someday. I will be a soldier brave and true and ever firmly take the stand as I onward go and daily meet the foe blessed Jesus hold my hand Jesus hold my hand Oh, no. 
dim toward the setting of the sun. Lead me safely to that land of rest in my crown. Of life have won. I have put my faith in thee, dear Lord, that I may reach the golden strand. There's no other friend on whom I can depend. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, Jesus, hold my hand. Hold my Jesus, hold my hand. Yes. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm Evangelist Donnie Lawson on behalf of the Not Ashamed Ministry team, and we would like to say thank you for worshiping with us on these broadcasts. If you have been blessed, you've been helped, in any way from these broadcasts, we would really appreciate hearing from you. Email us your prayer requests, your testimonials, to the address at the bottom of your screen, and we, we would will respond to you. And we would like to ask you to please continue to pray for us as we go about proclaiming the word of Christ in song and in word. And remember, Jesus is coming soon. And for those that are saved, those who are born again, and we pray that you are ready, and may the Lord richly bless you exceedingly abundantly above all that you may be able to ask or think in the service of Christ Jesus, not ashamed ministries. Thank you. May you have a blessed year. Call on Jesus anytime. Oh, yes, I can. You know, He is always on the line. He is King Almighty, and the Lord God is His name. Well, you know, I can call on Jesus anytime. Oh, you know, I can call on Jesus. Anytime, oh yes I can You know he is always on the line Oh, he is King Almighty And the Lord God is his name Well, you know I can call Jesus anytime When I get in trouble Fighting for the right, you know I can call on Jesus anytime. When I feel discouraged, He will lead me on. You know I can call Jesus anytime. Oh, you know I can call on Jesus anytime. Oh, Yes, I can. You know, He is always on the line. Well, He is King Almighty, and the Lord God is His name. Oh, you know, I can call on Jesus anytime. When the storm is raging, the billows roll, you know I can call on Jesus. 
Jesus any time When my heart is heavy And my spirit's low You know I can call Jesus any time Well, you know I can call him Jesus I can call him any time Oh, yes I can Anytime, oh yes I can I know He is always on the line And He is King Almighty And the Lord God is His name Well, you know I can call Jesus anytime
Hallelujah. Let's pray. Then remain standing for the reading of the word. As we get in the word this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, Lord, that you've made a way, God, where there was no way. Thank you, God, Lord. You're looking to come and get your church, Lord. Thank you, God, that you're just... You desire, God, to be in our presence, Lord. I pray your people would desire to be in your presence as much as you desire us to be in your presence. Oh, Father, Lord, I pray you would pour out your spirit in this service, God, because you're a mighty king, Lord, and I pray if there's any in the house, Lord, or any watching, Lord, that are lost and undone, Lord, or backslid from you, God, I pray they come to you today. Lord God, because there's no other name that can save like that mighty name of Jesus. We give you all the glory and honor. It's in your precious, wonderful name we pray. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For the Lord Himself, that's Jesus, shall descend from heaven with what? Everybody's waiting on that trumpet. But before the trumpet blows, Jesus Christ is going to release the excitement of His voice. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. What's the next thing? And with the voice of the archangel. That's two noises we're going to get to hear. Then the third noise we'll hear. And with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. If I don't make you want to shout and get excited, there ain't nothing on this planet. You need to get right with Jesus so you will get excited and shout that Jesus is going to be shouting when it comes time to come and get you. Jesus Christ is mighty. Lord has laid it on my heart. I've asked the pastors to come and help me with an illustration here in just a little bit. They should have asked me what that illustration was. But they said they would be willing to do so, so bless them for their obedience. It's not bad. You won't be ashamed. You won't be put to shame. I promise. But today, the topic today is marriage. It's Jesus Christ and the marriage with his bride. And I'm come today to make sure you're ready to be a part of that wedding feast. I pray you're ready. I pray you're ready to go. I pray that you are excited about this wedding feast. Genesis 2, 18, and the Lord God said, now it's already been voiced in here. It don't matter what you say. It don't matter what I say. It don't matter what anybody's opinion is. It's only what that book is. And the Lord God said in Genesis 1, 28, he said, it is not good for man to be alone, but I will make him a helpmeet. So why is it that the church attacks the institution of marriage? When God himself, the very first thing he saw, when Adam didn't have a helpmeet, that Adam needed a helpmeet. God ordained this first marriage. The institution of marriage has been attacked in America. The institution of the family has been trying to be de- is trying to be destroyed right now. And as we was praying over this map, I couldn't help but to think of praise God for Texas right now, who had stood up for an abortion bill and created out of the wisdom of men and women's mouths that have wrote this bill that the, that the instant that they find a heartbeat in a baby, it is now illegal to abort that child. Well, science says. Until they can chemically find out that there is a woman who's pregnant, the baby has already got a heartbeat. So out of the wisdom that God gives, man and women have been able to pen a law, and God has preserved life, and it has been upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States in the state of Texas. Now let's pray that it goes all across the land, and abortion is abolished. Hallelujah. How long has been married? Praise God. Give them a hand. In your research in marriage and divorce, 
Only eight and a half years is the average life expectancy of any wedding today. That is a shame. That is a crying shame. Eight and a half years. So 24 years. Give them another hand. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Glory to God. We're going to do a vow renewal today. A vow renewal. Because I do believe every now and then it's good to renew our vows to the Lord. Renew our commitment to what God has asked us to do. Brother, du Brother Doug and Sister Connie have made vows to one another. Vows unto death. Made vows unto death. That's not something that is taken lightly because they've made vows before man and they've made vows before God. So therefore they entered a covenant relationship with one another. And since they entered a covenant relationship with one another, it's a binding agreement, but they're also in covenant with God because they're no longer two. Now they are one. Marriage is a very powerful image. Is this not what Paul said? If you cannot withstand from one another and your lust is going to cause you to burn in hell, then you might as well get married is what Paul said. And I'm paraphrasing that. So going back into the, the two things that are done into the marriage, the vow and the covenant, the, the covenant is the signing of the marriage license. That is a legal document in a covenant relationship says you come together. The definition of it is a meeting or agreement or a coming together of minds, a mutual consent or agreement of two or more persons to do or to forbear some act or thing, a contract, a stipulation, a covenant is created by deed in writing, sealed and executed, and it may be implied in the contract. A writing containing containing the terms of agreement or contract between parties or clause of agreement in a deed containing the covenant. That's the definition of a covenant. Is we as humans only want to hear one side of the case. But no matter how flat the paper, there's two sides of the argument. If a, if a woman goes out and cheats on her husband, somewhere that husband neglected her and, forgot and did not at pay attention. Now, if a man goes out and cheats on his wife, somewhere she has... Stop respecting him. Because man looks for respect in all he does. A man desires respect. That's why he puts so much into his job. Because he, he gets the respect from other workers. Or he gets the respect off of the farmers that he may be farming with. Or he, he gets respect. So when he comes into his home and his wife does nothing but want to bash on him and gnash on him. He don't like being at home because he's not getting the respect that's deserved. But, right flip side from that, if that woman is respecting it, if she is doing everything she's supposed to do according to the Word of God, if she has submitted herself and you do not love her with the love of Christ, then you're in the wrong. If you've stopped paying attention to your wife, if you've stopped paying attention to her needs, way more than the physical needs, but you've stopped paying attention to the emotional and the spiritual needs that she has, because she needs you to be more than a provider, dads. She needs you to be more than a provider, husbands. She needs you to be the priest of that house. All the weight shouldn't fall on the woman to lead the children to God. All the weight shouldn't fall on the woman to sing praises unto God. All the weight shouldn't fall back on the woman to get up and go to church on Sunday. It goes way more than a paycheck, man. Way more than a paycheck. Why are you preaching on the brother so hard? Because I am a man, and I can talk to you. I've got a, a bo two boys over here, and I can be stern with them because they're boys. But my little girl, i got to be soft with her because she's my precious girl. So young ladies, no matter how old you are, young ladies... Because you all are all younger than God. Young ladies, you're precious in His sight, but you better be doing what God said to do. But the question that is always, since I've been a teenager and started understanding about marriage and relationships and covenants and all these words that get thrown around so loosely. My question is, always, why is it in the church house just as much as it is in the world? It's always been my question. 
Why is it inside the church? Yes, I understand the church house is a hospital for sinners. And I understand the sinners that are coming to get freedom from that. They may have that issue when they come in. But why is I'm not speaking to those. I'm not speaking to the ones coming for help. I'm speaking to the ones that's sitting in the pews and been in the pews for 20 years, walking out or going over and talking to that young lady that just walked in the door. And then you're a married man. I'm talking to the, to the women that's going over and talking to that new young preacher. And you're a married woman. We're talking about righteousness. We're talking about what God honors. God don't honor sin. God honors righteousness. And if you call yourself a born-again child of God, you better be acting like it. When somebody comes through that door dressed to the nines and they look good, you better watch what you say to them. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. First Corinthians, Paul's writing to the Corinthians. He said, moreover, brethren, I would not, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. It's First Corinthians chapter 10. If you want to mark it in your Bibles, go home and study it. So, evidently, this lie of environment is what changes people's perspective, is a complete lie from the enemy. This whole lie that psychology throws out there, that it's because they wasn't brought up in the correct environment, it's why they've turned away from God and walked out on God. That's a lie from the enemy. It's because they fail to do what God says to do. It's because they would rather listen to what heart says rather than what thus saith the Lord. Did not, did not the word say that all ate the same spiritual meat, all drank the same spiritual water, all walked through the same sea, all walked by the same cloud, all walked by the same pillar of fire? Then why did the ground swallow them up? And why did God strike them with diseases in the wilderness? Why did God wipe out those murmurers and complainers that came against Moses? Better be careful how you speak to your leaders in office. That goes for government leaders, and it also goes even more importantly for the house of God, because you touch not mine anointed. It's what the Word of God says. Better be careful the words you choose to use. It don't matter if you call yourself a priest or not, because we see in Scripture where there was priests that was doing priestly duties, and they rose up and said, I know a better way, Moses, and God said, you know what, Took them out right there. The ground opened them up. Korah. And Korah died. But the sad thing is, so many went with Korah. Just like so many is going to go. Does, has it ever crossed your mind that it is mind-boggling that a third of the angels have been deceived by Satan? If you think you, a child of God, born again, cannot walk away from God, because you've been saved, because you've been blood-bought, you don't think you can walk away from God? Well, explain to me how a third of the angels fell for the lie of Satan and got kicked out of heaven. You better pay attention to what thus saith the Lord and not what thus saith sounds good. God's Word. He says he's coming back looking for a holy church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And it's time the church of the living God would rise up and iron these garments. It's time to rise up and apply the bleach of the Holy Ghost of God. It's time to rise up and iron out these wrinkles and shake out these garments. Make sure there's no dust left in them no more. If we are in fellowship, if we are in, in a, say we're in an intimate relationship, a partnership, because that's what marriage is. Partnership is, is, come here, brother, come here, brother. Communism, everything you got is mine. Socialism, everything we got, we share. Partnership, 
We're going to make good on this on this deal. Yeah. Everything we make profit, we're going to get to share with them. 50 50. Amen. That's a partnership, right? Amen. That's a partnership. 50 yeah. 50. Everything's 50 50. And you'll hear that in marriage, but that's the wrong mathematical equation. See, the husband's got to get 50%, and the wife's got to get 50%. Well, they sometimes the wife's weak, and the wife can't give 50%. They sometimes the husband's weak, he can't give 50%. That's why both have to give 100%. Because one times one is one. Right? Not 50 plus 50 is 100. We're talking one times one is one. So if I'm doing my part, and my wife comes in, and she's doing her part, then we're one. But if I'm only doing 50% and she's doing 100%, we're only half. Marriage is not addition. It's multiplication. God, what is these commands on the earth? It's be fruitful and multiply. So it's not be, be fruitful and add. It's be fruitful and so it's multiply. It's a multiplication problem. Got to be multiplicities of the king. Sheep bear sheep. Goats bear goats. This was brought up not too long ago, and that makes so much sense. You got to feel. Recently, here the other day, and I'm going down a rabbit trail, but I'll come back and make this full circle. Recently, the other day, I was out at a farm, and this guy had probably 20 goats and 30 sheep and one guard dog. And I walked up to the fence, and I said, come here. And I've never got to see it this way before. I was going to pet the goats and the sheep. They was all real friendly. You could tell the goats ran right up to the electric fence. <laughs> Say the fence is right here. They're standing right there. Bye. Bye. All 20 goats. I've got a picture of it on my phone if you want to see it. All 20 goats right up against the fence. Fence is energized. They know not to touch it, but they're right there ready to be grabbed. Let me show you what, say the fence is right here. The sheep's back here, all huddled up. Okay, I hear this guy talking, but it don't sound like a voice that I'm used to. I hear this guy saying the same things as my master, but he don't look like him, don't smell like him, don't act like him. The dog's right here doing nothing. He's standing in between the goats and the sheep. He doesn't know there's a lost cause to go after the goats and get between them. Because he said, I ain't touching that fence. I've done touched that fence. I ain't touching it again. So I ain't getting in front of the goats. But I'm standing right here behind the goats, and you ain't touching one of these sheep. That's our shepherd. That's our mighty shepherd. You want to go but, 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 everything in this world? Go on, headlong. Run into the fence. Let the, let the enemy grab you. But if you want to be a sheep of God, you better be staying behind the shepherd in the field. You better be staying behind the protector. You better be Because I guarantee if I'd have hopped that fence, that big great Pyrenees has been on me like hot on or white on rice is what those things said. He was coming. He was done down in the lunge state and waiting for me to come across there, trying to blend in. But he was ready to protect the flock. Dads, that's what we ought to look like. Willing to fight for anybody, but making sure our flock's covered, making sure our flock's protected. But if we're in fellowship, partnership with Christ, we take communion up here many times. I don't know if you can do it out here a bunch, Brother Doug. I don't get to come out here much, but where I come from, we've done it once a year, and I think we ought to do it more than once a year. But this holy communion, to be in communion with one another, or in the Greek is koinonia. I can't hardly say it because I'm country. But I learned this the other day in a, a Bible class, a Sunday school classroom. Our Sunday school is precious. 
our anointed teachers that are very precious. We get more feeding from the teachers many times than we do a, a five-minute preaching message. The five-minute preaching message may get us to the altar, but it's those those seasoned teachers that are full of the Holy Ghost of God can care, help carry you through this life and can help lead and st- stir you. So when we look at the gifts that God's given the church, we ought not neglect the teachers in the church. We ought not neglect those that have been called to teach those that are back here training the young and the next generation that's coming see there's more that should be going on behind these closed doors than just singing great songs and I'm, I'm all for singing songs I'm, I'm not preaching get you sister and making crafts and stuff there, there's so much because we used to do it me and my wife but you see it in so many churches to where they just want to get the children away from the presence of God and hold them back there and not teach them anything I'm so thankful as I walk down through here they was singing songs about Jesus they wasn't singing out here about this old mule I went to one one kid school when I was a child and I remember them singing about a mule named Sarah I was thinking what in the world is this first time I've ever been in a church of this kind and you're singing about a mule you ain't singing about Jesus and I'm just a little fella I'm five six years old it matters what we teach and train our children it matters When they go back here behind these doors, it's not to be shut off or walled off away from God, but it's time that we we call on the anointing of the Holy Ghost and ask Him how to get down on this child's level and make them understand it because the gospel is so simple that even a child can understand that Jesus Christ loves them. Jesus Christ died for them. Jesus Christ paid a price for them. And Jesus Christ wants them to live eternally. And Jesus Christ is coming back for them. And Jesus Christ wants them to be holy. Even a child can understand it. So why does adults have so much time, hard time understanding it? But this word communion means to be in fellowship or association, community with one another, joint participation. That's why it's so important if Jesus Christ is going to be shouting when he comes back that I'm shouting to go with him, right? Because we're in joint participation in this thing. And to share which one has in anything. Now, let's go back to the checkbook, right? I don't have anything to give God that would ever measure up to anything except me. Say, Lord, I, you take me and use me, right? But see, when God writes us down in that name, right, he gives us access to the checkbook. He gives us access to those gifts of healing. He gives us access to the gifts of faith. He gives us access to prayer. He gives us access to righteousness. He gives us access to the throne room when we're in desperate need. See, God gives us access to His account. He don't come in and just take everything we've got like these gods that are made by hands and take all the food and take all of everything and leave you hungry and dry. No, God, He puts back in. He says, here, you can't never give me what I've already got. Let me give unto you. These poor third world countries that worship these gods that's made with their hand, they're starving to death, created a crisis. And if you're not looking around, America's doing the same thing. We're creating a crisis for the people because we're worshiping something other than the Lord God Almighty. We're worshiping someone else's name other than Jesus Christ. We're no longer as a whole from California over to North Carolina, from Washington down to Florida. We're no longer singing those praises of Jesus Christ. I pray we hear the reports that Jesus is working in every one of these cities saving souls. Three hundred and fifty million people is what they say lives in America. An estimated three hundred and fifty million. Ten percent is what I heard a statistic the other day. Goes to church. It's three point five million, or let's see, thirty five million. Of that thirty five million people go to church. How many is truly born again? How many is doing what this book says? Because many that's got their name on a church roll or sit in a church pew or doing something, they're not living, thus saith the Lord. It's such a sad fact. 
It's such a sad thing that we see day in and day out people calling themselves child of God, children of the living God, born again believers, the bride of Christ. But yet when they walk through those doors, they lay it all back down right here in the church and they go pick up the way they want to live. And that's not this church, that's every church. Every church. There's someone in the church that's not doing what they ought to be doing. Otherwise, that church would be blowing out the windows to get people to church to hear the gospel. Because when the man of God is doing what the man of God's supposed to be doing, and the woman of God's doing what the woman of God's supposed to be doing, the house is full because God is working and moving mightily. I'm not coming down on this church hard. I'm telling you, it's all across the land. You go in it and people, you can say, people don't want to hear it. Yeah, but make people hear it. Like Brother Donnie said the other day, you give enough, you give a horse enough salt, they're going to want to come drink. If you don't tell them nothing else, if you quit talking about the Steelers game, if you quit talking about the Tennessee Vols, and you just tell them what Jesus Christ is doing, every time they bring it up, and for the love of God, stop talking about fantasy football, because who wants to live in a fantasy? Give them Jesus. Give them Jesus. When they come to you and want to talk about work, give them Jesus. Yeah, I know you can't live with your heads up in the clouds and stuff, and we've got to do things while we're here on this earth. That's why Paul was a tent maker, but he gave them Jesus. You don't read in the Bible where Paul made a bunch of tents. You don't read how many he made. You don't read where all he went building tents. You just read about Paul. He built tents for a little bit, but he gave them Jesus. The books are being recorded today. What are they writing about you and me? What are they saying about you and me? Whew. Oh, goodness. Most of this ain't in the notes. I've got a lot of notes. Most of it is not in the notes. But I feel like this is... Come to a close. Can I have y'all come back to the music? I'm so thankful for another opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation. The power of God. You hear that sound? That sound, there's babies in the house. That sound, that there's, there's new babes in the house of God. That's a wonderful sound. Here in just a few more months, Anthony and Savannah is going to get to hear that joyous sound all night long. <laughs> Weeks. Don't the Bible say out of the mouth of babes comes perfected praise? Have you ever had a bad day's work and you come home and your children so excited to see you? Come running up to you shouting, Mama, 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 or Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. No matter what you've dealt with all day long, the second you hear those words, everything just takes a back burn. And you know you're home. Our Father, God, is preparing a bride for His Son, Jesus. And he's not going to give his son less than best. He's given him a glorious church. Not a building. He's given him a gift of love. 
back to Him. Those that are faithful and true. Those that desire. His last words that He said, I go and prepare a place for you. Even in Hebrew, Hebrew teaching resembles a husband engaging a bride a groomsman going and saying hey I'm going to build a place for you to come back so we can have many good years together even the way Jesus preached his last sermons resembled a marriage marriage is so important to God it's not something to be trodden underfoot it's not something to be thrown to the wayside. It's something that takes a lot of hard work, dedication. And no, I'm not perfect at marriage. God has, has done a lot of working in me. I've studied a lot about me to make me a better man for my wife and my kids. And it takes digging in His Word. Not what a psychologist says. Not even what preachers say. It takes digging in the Word of God to see what type of man or woman we should be for the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. It won't be long, church. And there'll be a shout made in the heavens. Then there'll be an archangel crying out. Then there'll be that wonderful trumpet blow. Then there'll be a wonderful meeting in the air. If you're not ready for that meeting today, or if you've backed away from God, come to this altar. I don't have to lay hands on you. I don't even have to pray with you if you don't want me to. You come up here and make sure your heart's right with Jesus. If you're watching on TV, and you feel a tug in your heart that you're missing something, that you need this Jesus. All you have to do is say, God, I'm not good enough. I need you to save me, Lord. God, I need you to come in and make me new and believe it in all your heart that he's going to do it. Jesus Christ will save you. Then go and tell somebody that Jesus Christ has made you new. That you've been born again. And go and find you a church somewhere that believes that Bible cover to cover. It don't matter how many's in the room. Go find you a church that believes that Bible cover to cover. Because if they don't even believe the Word of God, you don't have no business being there. Yes, God said I'm married to the backslider. But if you go and study that out, you hear that passage. And you can almost hear the broken heart of God as He's talking about Israel. All this I've done for you. All this I've prepared for you. All this I've promised you. And you'd still rather choose a lie than the truth. You're backslidden and away from God. Come home. Come home. Come home. Now, if you're a child and you're in need of anything, anything, You just desire more of God's presence. You just want to be in your daddy's presence even more. Come get it. We miss the altar call so many times because we don't want to get up and come get what God has for us. But I make these kids of mine do this. So I know God makes His kids do this. Sometimes His kids are too weak to go and get what they need. That's when God will come to us. But when His kids are good enough to, to get up and go get what they need and they're sitting there screaming, go get me this, go get me this, go get me this. 
And God says, I got it right here beside me if you'll just come get it. Maybe the Father wants to get you in arm's reach to where He can get past what you think you need and give you what you truly need. I'm not ashamed to stand for Jesus. He took a stand for me.